for taking time to be out here. And it's a privilege for me to be up here. As Wade said, I, I watched as well uh, nine years ago. I think most Californians did uh, for Governor Brown, then Governor Brown's press conference in 2015 because of the acuity of the pending crisis as it relates to the ratification of California and the extreme mega drought that we were in. Of course, uh, we're here nine years later reconciling the extremes, reconciling the extreme weather whiplash. And I think today punctuates the point. Uh, we began the water year as we do every uh, water year in October, bone dry October, uh, significantly below average rainfall and snowfall during the fall, only to th see things uh, get colder uh, and to get to about average in March and now slightly above average in April. These extremes are becoming the new reality. And that new reality requires a new approach and a new sophistication in terms of the way we address and manage our water system. I'll remind all of you, the water uh, system in California was designed for a world that no longer exists. It was designed for a world uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago uh, where there was some normalcy. There was some normal expectation. Sure, year-to-year -year variations. No one's naive about that. Uh, one weather uh, system or one uh, weather year doesn't necessarily make a trend, but we've seen that trend line over the course of the last many decades becoming a headline, not just here in California, but across the country and increasingly across the globe as it relates to the hot's getting a lot hotter, the dry is getting a lot drier, and the wet's getting a lot wetter. And that requires us to have a sophistication of approach that includes new strategies for conveyance, new strategies for stormwater capture, high flow stormwater capture, groundwater replenishment, water recycling, the strategies to uh, make conservation a way of life, uh, strategies that incorporate uh, proven solutions at the federal level, uh, but more sophisticated solutions at the local and regional level. The water plan we're advancing here today builds, as Wade and Carla said, on the plans we put out in 2020 and 2022. I'll remind you, in 2020, uh, we put out a plan with 142 specific actions to address the needs region by region. It was a regional framework recognizing this fact that I often repeat. California is the size of 21 state populations combined. And as a consequence, there's no one size that fits all. So this notion of bottom up region by region and focusing on localism and local strategies and solutions is the framework, uh, the backbone of our strategies. In 2022, we built on that water portfolio, uh, that water resilience portfolio strategy uh, by recognizing that the science was teaching us something even more alarming, that by 2040, in a matter of years, 15, 16 years from now, uh, all things being equal, knowing what we know today, the scientists say that we're going to be living with about 10 percent less water just on the natural, on the basis of what's happening in the climate. That's just in the next 15 to 16 years. And so we put out a hotter, drier strategy to make up for that supply to create new supply. We talked about the importance of desalinization. We talked about the importance of stormwater capture. We wanted to build on some of the water recycling work that we've done, and we incorporated new strategies around large-scale conveyance. We updated folks on the Delta conveyance. Uh, we updated folks on sites. And just recently, we updated and modernized our permitting and our regulatory structures. Over the course of the last two years working with the legislature, we pushed through historic efforts to streamline and fast track and reduce and mitigate litigation risks associated with moving projects forward. And today we've incorporated all of that into our five-year water plan that we're releasing. So that's the why I'm here today specifically uh, to mark, yes, this moment, uh, this annual moment uh, that's become uh, normalized here in the state of California as we wait with bated breath to see how we're doing, uh, but also to mark uh, a framework into the future, letting folks know that we get it and we're starting to get things done at the next level. You're seeing the progress now because of the streamlining on sites. You're seeing the progress we're making on the large scale conveyance uh, at the Delta conveyance, which, by the way, the Delta conveyance is an adaptation project. The Delta conveyance is foundational. It's critical if we're going to address the issue of climate change. It is a climate project. It is one of the most important projects this state can advance. Uh, and I just want to thank our team for recognizing the importance and the imperative of moving that project, along with all of these other projects we set forth 
in the 10 regions that we identify in this five-year plan and the 15 specific markers of considerations within those regions that we're trying to reconcile and address. That's the long-winded uh, point. Take a look at the plan. There's a great summary uh, that's available. Uh, but I want folks to know in this state uh, that we are not just victims of fate, uh, that we recognize the world we're living in. We recognize the trend lines into the future, and we're navigating them. And I'll close to give you a proof point. Nine billion dollars have been invested, nine billion dollars, just in the last 36 months in these projects and these proposals. And by the way, that also includes clean, safe drinking water. A hundred consolidated wells in this state, 300 more that we're actively working on to address water insecurity. Two million uh, Californians have had improved water as a consequence of those plans, all part of that $9 billion that's been invested. So serious moment. Uh, we recognize our responsibility. There's nothing normal about this average year. It's just the new reality and the new normal. And that's what we're here highlighting today. With that, we're happy to take any questions. Hi, Governor. Tori, you're with CBS 13. Um, I know we were talking about the plan, mentioning it's going to be focused on the watershed scale and also mentioning that with forest management. Yep. Specifically, how does today's snow survey impact what we're going to see when it comes to wildfire season and just in general? Well, I mean, so it relates to wildfire season. The situational announcement we're making today, meaning this annual announcement does not get in the way from our multi-year commitment to improve forest management and vegetation management. Uh, this administration, our administration of the last five years has recognized that. In fact, the first executive order I took as governor of California within, I think, 24 hours of becoming governor was up in Placer County, where I signed an emergency deck to allow us to move forward and address some of the environmental regulations that were slowing down more active forest management uh, to address the realities uh, of these extremes. So we continue uh, apace in that respect, billions of dollars being invested uh, in our wildfire plan. I laid that out in the January budget without any cuts of significance in the January budget. I hope to maintain that. We'll see where the revenue comes in in the May revise to continue those uh, efforts. Uh, but I think it's important. I mean, we're here, the Caldor fire, I mean, the symbolism of this, the substance of being here. Uh, you compare and contrast just a few years ago, the Phillips family's been here uh, since the beginning of time. The great, great, great uh, grandmother that uh, founded this site or at least established uh, her footprint and the family's footprint on this site. Uh, recognize uh, the world's changed and we need to change and adapt with it. And active forest management's a big part of that, including work that I've done with Wade and others. Uh, just right up here uh, on the hillsides, we were working with the National Guard and the California Conservation for, uh, uh, Board uh, to actively uh, address some of the vegetation management efforts. So we'll continue those efforts. Uh, we're going to update you on the wildfire plan in just a few months. We were talking about uh, that today, including the new C 130s. We got seven of them into the state. They're not all flagged yet under CAL FIRE. We're working on that, but that's a big addition to our wildfire fleet. And as it relates to the drought, um, we are moving. I, I hesitate always to say we're out of the drought, go back to the way things used to be. In August, we put out uh, a conservation plan, conservation in California as a way of life. And I would point you to that August 2023 plan because we want to enshrine some of our nation leader, world leading efforts really on water conservation and make that a way of life. But clearly this advances multiple years, 200% last year, 100 plus percent this year. Uh, we're in a different place than we were. You can take a deep breath this year, but don't quadruple the amount of time in your shower. Uh, spend as much time as you need to get clean, feel good and healthy, uh, and then consider uh, that this time next year we may be in a different place. Oh, yeah. The question is, how soon do you think all of these efforts will start to lower the out-of-control crime in Oakland, and how soon will Oakland residents start to feel safer? Well, I think uh, I've been there a lot. I'm there pretty much every week. I'm hearing from business owners and residents that it is already having an impact. We update you on a consistent basis, the CHP, the number of uh, uh, stolen vehicles 
uh, that we've recovered, the number of arrests that we have made, uh, the number of guns we've taken off the streets. So that's immediate. That's being felt, not just in Oakland. We have that CHP operations moved into other parts of the East Bay. Uh, the flock cameras that we're putting up are very familiar to Californians, particularly those in the Bay Area. There's the same flock cameras that uh, use similar technology that toll bridges use, Amber Alert system use. We're going to have 480 of those in and around Oakland on the three freeways and thoroughfares and within Oakland proper. Uh, we're going to get those up in the next few months. That's not coming overnight, but that's a significant procurement, and it adds and stacks to all the other work we're doing, including the 10-point Caltran plan and the work we're doing on community building, uh, not just a law enforcement-focused plan. And as you noted, and I appreciate your reference, uh, we have JAGs that will be coming to support uh, the district attorney, uh, and we're working with the state DOJ, Rob Bonta's office, to also aid uh, in the prosecution uh, of cases in Oakland as well. So it's all part of a multi-pronged plan. I said it wasn't going to be episodic. I said it wasn't going to be one-off. And I think uh, the proof point is in the frame of your question. We've been there for consistent announcements and will continue to be there until uh, we feel like Oakland on their own can take the baton. We did something similar in San Francisco. We feel like San Francisco directionally uh, is moving in a very positive way uh, and place. And just to preview, we will look forward soon to making additional announcements in other cities throughout the state of California to address some of their concerns as well. Well, I, look, I, too early to tell. I mean, you, you, we, you saw the detailed hour-plus presentation in January of the plan. Uh, you've seen the Senate's detailed plan, the $17.1, $17.2 billion. You've seen the plan from the Assembly uh, that's approximating uh, that number as well. We're working on the final details of that in real time, as you suggest. Uh, so those are familiar uh, issues. Uh, we're waiting for the new cash numbers, not only uh, from uh, March, but the key ones in April. Uh, and then we'll have a very tight timeline between that and the May revise, and that will reveal itself. Uh, but I don't want to overpromise on the basis, particularly of those February numbers, but I don't want to overindulge uh, in speculation either because in those February numbers captured some good numbers, good news, the $1.2 billion that was captured uh, in prepayments uh, that did portend some uh, positive uh, news, but again, too early to tell. And then just a quick follow-up on early budget action. Any update on the uh, I, I just can't impress upon you more how impressed I am with the leadership of both the Assembly and the Senate. I know that doesn't make for good news. Uh, we all like controversy, uh, but uh, it's newsworthy uh, when everybody's getting along during challenging times, and I'm just really proud of the new leadership. Uh, that have taken this as seriously as they have and are moving as few legislatures have in the past that have addressed, addressed budget shortfalls uh, uh, with, with assuredness uh, and uh, fortitude and focus, uh, recognizing that this will be the first uh, of uh, the many efforts we'll need to take uh, over the course, not just the next few months as we land a budget, but over the next few years uh, to right-size the anomaly uh, that was the last four or five years of just massive surpluses, the likes of which no jurisdiction on planet Earth has ever seen. I'm just not aware of a subnational government running $177.7 billion operating surplus over a 24-month period, only to see that anomaly get normalized, but with a deficit that now requires us to balance in so many ways, isn't it? The budget, the expression of the story we're trying to tell here as it relates to weather. And interestingly, the budget deficit in many ways was a reflection of the weather story because it was the delay from the IRS that led to the unknown. And that delay was not just here in California in the tax receipts because of the extreme weather and major flooding, but was also expressed across the country and had an impact on the federal government's estimates as well. Of the, uh, There's only a few hundred pages. I, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm test you on it when we're done. <laughs> uh, anyways, I was going to ask in the sense. There is a summary. I, I recommend the summary. <laughs> Good. I will absolutely take a look at that. Uh, in the 
sense of the plan, uh, in the sense of the reservoir, um, I know you mentioned sites reservoir. Uh, how many res new reservoirs are we talking about in the next five years? Uh, and then just overall, uh, your message to the people of California about this plan. I know you, you're talking about it here, but you know, when people in Southern California yeah. and uh, Coachella Valley, elsewhere, say, "Oh, we want new reservoirs, or we need this, yeah. we need that," <laughs> what's your message to them? Well, we're going to build the first new reservoir in half a century in California. We're fast tracking that under new permitting regime uh, that we promoted. I think they're very pleased uh, that we're finally seeing progress on sites. Uh, we're seeing real progress on conveyance with the Delta Tunnel, which I right-sized when I first got here five years ago, and, and my goal is get that permitted by the time you kick me out. Now, uh, you know, we never know. We got this new recall. We'll see. Uh, but give me three years, and I'll get that done. At least that's my goal. Uh, don't hold me completely to the exact month, but within a margin of error. The hope and expectation is as well to ally the concerns not just of those that are looking for more above ground storage and new conveyance, but also those that believe in more natural solutions, the natural infrastructure. One of the hallmarks of this plan is the integration, the connection between built infrastructure and natural infrastructure, the connection between rivers and watersheds, the connection between meadows like this and forests uh, and how they connect to the backbone of our system, which is the State Water Project and the Central Valley Water Project. And that's laid out and specified in here. And I think finds that balance uh, in a rather significant way, particularly uh, based on the fact that we're investing significant money to make real what we're promoting in ways we haven't in the past. Uh, I'll just close on this to your point. We believe in creating new water supply. Uh, and you create new water supply in many different ways. Uh, groundwater replenishment uh, by capturing high flows. And you saw the executive order I advanced a year or so ago. And then the other work we're doing with the legislature in that space, that's showing progress and promise, not close to where we need to be. The desalinization work, brackish desal, not just the old school desal on the coast. And of course, the stormwater capture work that we're investing in, uh, LA, Orange County, and others that are doing significant work. And we maintain that vigilance, particularly working with ag uh, on efforts uh, related uh, to Healthy Soils Initiative, the work we're doing on regenerative ag, uh, and the work, of course, we're doing as it relates to water efficiency and precision technology, which is a huge part of this story, innovation which is the cornerstone of this five-year plan. Things that we couldn't have imagined five years ago in the plan are now incorporated in this plan. Yes, all things AI, but well beyond that, uh, new technologies that aid us in uh, these manual collections that are also aided by what happens unseen above us, uh, which are complementary to one, to not one another. Thank you so much, Mr. Governor. Mr. Good. Engineer Rising, very quickly. Good. Get him up here. <laughs> Very quickly, I want to make sure I understood logistically, uh, make sure our access to our reporting is accurate. You say this is obviously still a station here in Northern Sierra, 113% of average. What is the statewide? I heard 105 and 110. What, what was the statewide average? We're not complete measuring the snow courses. That was 105, but the snow sensor network this morning was measuring 110. You're not, you, the, an actual precise number is not really uh, what we're after. It's more relative, but... It is above average, 110%, we'll say. Yeah. Above average. That's your headline. <laughs> above average. I'll take it. I'll make my way over without yeah, falling over. Well, um, what's the plan? I know a new budget estimate for Delta County Lake is coming out. What's the plan to finance that project? And what's the outlook for how you find bonds to bring that project? Well, we're working with the legislature to make a determination on the bonds. And as you know, there's three schools of bond thought right now, school bonds, a housing bond, and a climate bond. Uh, can't do everything uh, and can't do everything at once. We're mindful of the bond uh, ceiling as it relates to debt load. Uh, and uh, we're also mindful of the bond we just passed as well and the fact that we'll be moving to expedite the sales of that bond so we can get those dollars out. More on that as a preview uh, forthcoming. As it relates to uh, more broadly, uh, the issue of the Delta. We're going to be updating that plan very uh, shortly. Uh, so I'll let uh, that plan speak for itself in terms of revealing uh, the new estimated costs. But the costs are provided, or at least borne, uh, by users. 
uh, and that's the partnership uh, with many users, large and small, from the Met large size to the smaller uh, uh, users that have already, a number of them have already uh, signed up. And so we're working uh, to address the remaining issues on permitting environmental work, which we've been able to fast track, Carla, thank you, um, because of their great work, keeping that on time and focused. Uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to working with those boards over the course of the next number of months to specifically answer the question uh, with more nuance and sophistication. But that's a process that quite literally is unfolding in real time. I have my VA experts right here. I'm oh, going right. to I'm glad to take the time. Yeah. There's uh, there's two middle initials V and A. Yeah, so th thanks for the question, Ari, and th this is an important distinction to make. So we are all focused on updating what's called the Sacramento-San Joaquin Bay Delta Water Quality Plan, which is our state water board's standards that they set for the amount of flows and the environmental conditions in our rivers. That is not a cause of debate. Um, our focus is to put forward a proposed pathway to implement those updated standards, so those regulations, uh, in a manner that can be implemented quickly and effectively. And that's what has been called the voluntary agreements. Now, there's nothing voluntary about the agreements if they're adopted to implement the regulation. They will be enforceable by water agency uh, and by all of the signatories of that uh, set of agreements. Our focus now, and the way we talk about it, is the Healthy Rivers and Watersheds Agreement because it does a few things. One, it increases flows uh, throughout the water years, whether they're dry years or wet years. Flows are important to environmental conditions. Importantly, it expands habitat, particularly for the imperiled fish and wildlife that need more habitat and have lost that habitat over decades. But it also does something that regulations can't do and wouldn't do. And it creates governance among water users and conservation groups and tribes should they want to participate to adaptively manage those flows and those habitat over time using investments in scientific monitoring that will be publicly transparent. So what we have is one pathway that's purely regulatory, and I've heard from supporters of, the, of that pathway that that could even take on the short end seven to nine years to implement, including all of the water rights adjudications that need to happen. We have a pathway through this pathway of implementation, Healthy Rivers and Landscapes Agreement, which we're already implementing. So our water board is assessing this set of agreements according to uh, a peer-reviewed scientific basis report. So they're going to do that independent analysis, but we're not waiting. Our agency has $340 million uh, on the street right now to, to purchase environmental flows, to restore flows into rivers. And last year, we completed over 30 habitat projects already. So we're not waiting for the adoption of that approach to update the regulations because, as we've talked about today, the climate's not waiting for us. And so we need conditions. We need to improve conditions for the environment. That's not only beneficial for those ecosystems, the fish and wildlife, it's beneficial for those water agencies too, because the more that we can recover salmon, we can recover these endangered species, we stabilize our environment, the, the stronger and more predictable regulatory environment that provides for water supply. So we're very bullish. We're working through that water board process. While we're not waiting or sitting on our hands, we're taking these actions now. Amen. We talk about the old binary. We're just moving past the old binaries. And, and when I got here, it was just, it was a litigation posture, back and forth, zero sum game, no real progress. Uh, what he just expressed, I, I think, is the right path, stubborn as it is. And I get it. It's a, it's a give and take. And uh, I'm really proud of the, the work they've done on these voluntary agreements. And hey, look, I, I'll just close on this. And, and we're, you know, enjoy the day, by the way. My gosh. Uh, <laughs> But it's uh, you know it's it's been it's been a privilege to work with 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 all the folks you see behind me and and their sincerity and their intention intentionality in terms of trying to address these issues and work through I mean these all these stuff none of this is easy water I mean this is you can go back to every good Mark Twain quote uh, I mean this is this, some of the most stubborn and challenging issues uh, that exist not just here but all over the Western United States and I'm really proud of the leadership here in this state and I recognize we have a lot of work to do and there is a state of mind around flexibility and adaptation and moving away from zero sum. Uh, with that, 
We all wish you a wonderful day, and we hope uh, you all have a snowball fight before you leave. Oh, wait, there's one more. Because ABC10 stands for you. Yeah, that's right. All right, sorry. <laughs> okay, good, okay, yeah, sorry. ABC10. Okay, okay, sorry. But just going to ask you, Governor, we know there was a delay to the State of the State. When will you be holding that? And then also, what's the plan looking like? You know, last year you did a tour. Yeah, um, which was a, a lot of fun. I think I did 25 states of the state. I was in every part of the state. Uh, and, uh, and, and actually, I thought that connected in a way that one-off speeches don't anymore. Uh, these are not the State of the Unions. Uh, even the State of the Union is not what it once was. And so I appreciate you even asking me about when the State of the State is. Uh, so working with the legislature, uh, they were obviously on recess, and we're looking to land that. Uh, the most important thing was what we stated at the time was to get an early budget deal. We were able to do that on the day that the speech, uh, at least uh, directionally, an announcement with the leaders of both houses uh, on the same day that the State of the State was supposed to occur. And we now have uh, a State of Prop 1, uh, which is not inconsequential. Uh, I, you ask the voters what are the top three issues in the state. They're going to say issues of affordability, housing, homelessness, issues around substance abuse and mental health. Uh, those were foundational uh, in that reform, uh, and now we have clarity. And so we'll have a lot to say on that and the budget uh, as we get closer to the state of the state. It'll be also around the time of the May revise. So we thought we could collapse a lot of those things together uh, and make this a more interesting speech uh, and one that uh, will have a little more meat on it uh, than some of these others. I hope soon. I don't, I don't want to tie myself down. It's really, it's, uh, it's their house, uh, their rules, and I'll abide by them. As I said, uh, I, I, the relationship right now is, is really focused on the budget and this early action. Uh, but uh, we'll land a, a time and we're ready to go because uh, we've got clarity on what we want to say. Thank you. Is it all right if you clear up what average and normal is after 13, 15 years of drought? How do we know what average mm. and normal is? Yeah. How do we believe you? Anymore. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's right. Well, <clears throat> absolutely. I mean, climate change is happening. And, um, you know, some of the things that we do to address what is uh, the average. In fact, two years ago, we revamped all our forecasting system and, and took a new average of the last 30 years. We used to do 50 year averages, and that's because we wanted to, uh, you know, back then when it wasn't changing as much, it was more. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think thir we thought that 30 years would be more reflective of the new, n n the no normal, right? <laughs> it's more reflective of, of how, how the climate is changing and, and by taking a shorter number of years as an average. And we will be changing that every five years um, to update as we have this whiplash as we've talked about. So. Um, Yeah, that's a good question. It's it's hard to address. There's so many numbers that fly at us, and how to how to address that best. Go ahead, okay. please, yeah, Carla. Yeah. yeah. So it, as you might imagine, it's a little more complicated, and that when we look at water management over the hundred plus years, you know, some of the correlations are still valid, and so we take those into consideration. Uh, but we have sharpened our focus on the previous 30 years. We do that with our partners at the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation adopting the same thing in the Colorado watershed so we can start to understand um, how to move through what I would consider kind of more conservative approaches um, because what we don't want to do as water managers is make a lot of decisions early in the season because we look back 100 years and we were sure this was going to happen. Now we're not so sure. And if if we have a little bit more uh, focus and, and conservativeness on understanding lots of caveats around how we use averages, then we can make better decisions early on that enable us to make sure that people have enough drinking water, that at least our e ecosystems have a threshold of water that can help us move through. Um, and it just sets us up, I think, for more balanced decisions across all the needs that we have in California. So not everything is, um, is a big red flag. There are some trend lines over the last hundred years that are still holding, um, and those are, are all part of our calibration. I might just make a last, last point. You know, in the simplest of terms, we can't take this snowpack for granted anymore. You know, decades ago, there'd be a lot of focus on what the seasonal snowpack is, and if it was normal, then it's, you know, back to normal. 
and it's only when we experienced dry periods where you know everyone ramps up emergency response etc the fact is over the last five years we recognize that 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 won't do um, we've got a great snowpack this year we had a, an incredible snowpack last year we may be headed into an extended drought the worst in the state's history so we have to take advantage of you know uh, every storm when 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 it comes and that's why you know what, what director namath and the governor talked about within this plan is really doubling down and recognizing the the need to do that Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, right? And so we know that we have these facilities that were built, you know, decades and decades ago that were built to address a particular kind of hydrology. What we also know with climate is that when we have the storms, they're coming in much, much bigger. So we need more facilities, surface water. And by the way, our underground uh, the reason the governor is so focused on recharging groundwater basins is underground aquifers are about 10 times the capacity of our above ground reservoirs. They function a little bit differently, but we know we're going to need more reservoirs to act really as regulators because of the shrinking snowpack. So if more comes as rain, we won't have this great natural storage that we're standing on. And that's why part of adaption, uh, adaptation to more swings in weather includes more physical infrastructure, improved backbone infrastructure, integrated with a lot of these more natural kinds of solutions like floodplain management and the ways in which we can capture stormwater and send of, instead of send it immediately out to the ocean. It's all of those things together, Ari. Yeah. Thank you. All right.